Hey everyone, welcome to the Processing Blue podcast, where we talk about the Panthers for the Charlotte Observer. This is Mike Kay, uh, one of the Charlotte Observer's two Panthers beat reporters. I'm joined by Alex Zetlow, the, the other <laughs> Panthers beat reporter. Oh, okay, is that what we're doing? Yeah, that? I mean, you made a funny face at me when I did the <laughs> intro, so I felt like it, it, I needed to take at least one, like, kind of... We go. We, we do the podcast in person once, and you're already throwing shots. Yeah. Hey, what are we in? Fifty seconds in. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm getting you know side eyes from uh, <laughs> producers right now. So, Alex, we are five practices into training camp. There have been pads. Mm-hmm. Um, we've seen a lot of aerial a- acrobatics, so <laughs> to speak, from uh, the Panthers' offense. We've also seen some pretty standout plays from from the defense as well um it's also been hot it's rained a lot i had soggy socks one day (laughs) um people have retired like there's a lot to get to so let's kind of jump into it um guys have have had their stock go up they've had their stock go down there have been some guys who've kind of just been uneventful where there's been no no news it's been good news for them um, but I think there's a lot to talk about as far as, you know, training camp's about competing, right? And so the pads are on now. We saw a little bit of fire out of some guys, especially Miles Sanders. Wink, um, wink. wink. Um, those who know, know. And so I think for for us as beat reporters, like, this is probably my favorite time of the year. Like, inside info, I love taking notes. I love being able to to like analyze what we do right like that's mm-hmm. kind of what i'm known for mm-hmm. and that's really early on in my career that's how i kind of made my brand and so what's cool about this and one of my favorite parts of this whole thing is you and i working together you being new a little bit new to the nfl seeing you kind of blossom as a reporter during training camp noticing things us going back and forth and so i'm curious Who's the guy to you, or, or excuse me, the two guys to you who have really raised their stock this summer, just based on your note taking, based on your analysis, based on what you've seen with your eyes? Yeah. Okay. My two guys. Okay. Jonathan Mingo, and I'm going to take another obvious one, Bryce Young. Do it. Obvious uh, doesn't mean wrong. Right. So Jonathan Mingo, he didn't have, it's well documented that he, he didn't have the rookie season that Panthers were expecting him to, that we were kind of expecting him to last year at this point of the year. Um, he, hey, you did a really good job of kind of surmising his season last year. This season in training camp, not only is he looking confident, looking happy, looking comfortable, he's also producing. And he's, and like the chemistry between him and Bryce Young, I said it before, is it, it seems like, it seems like a new duo between the two of them it doesn't seem like that these two played together last year it seems like they're getting to know each other for the first time this year Bryce Young is doing his creativity thing he's being Bama Bryce as you said and that is kind of where Jonathan Mingo thrives off of the third off the second or third cut he's getting open he's finding a way open he's proving that he can be reliable um he's also showing a little bit of his personality he's being fun I know I I know I talk about this a lot but he was very fun when we asked him, hey, what's your relationship with Xavier to get like? And he was just like, well, now I'm the second most country person on the team. Talked a lot about how he and Bryce have kind of gelled this past offseason when the two went in California together. Um, Jonathan Mingo looks good. And if and if Mingo can be that third wide receiver, that fourth wide receiver for this team, this team ought, all of a sudden has some depth that we didn't think they would. Um, and then, of course, my second guy, Bryce Young. He is processing really well. Dave Canales is really high on him. He's getting the ball out on time, according to Dave. He's being creative. He is being this guy who, you know, the Panthers thought that they would get last year. And, of course, first pad of practice today, we're recording on a Tuesday. So it's a long road ahead. And, of course, and we also learned that this team probably still isn't one quarterback away from being a playoff team. But all signs are pointing to the positive. Mike, what about you? Who are you two guys? Well, I'm going to do a group because we talked about the like the low and high expectations. This cornerback group outside of J.C. Horn on paper leaves a lot to be desired. And not necessarily – I brought this up the last podcast. 
podcast, not necessarily because of their individual talent, but factoring in the fact that there's a massive talent drop off after mm-hmm. JC Horn. Yeah. And I think Dane Jackson has done a really nice job of kind of being that physical number two corner. Um, he's been in on every play. Like you're not seeing him get beat deep. Like if he's losing on a jump ball, it's like the guy is significantly taller or out muscling him. I mean, I think he's looked pretty good in coverage. Um, he's had some pass breakups. Uh, I like his attitude. They put in DiCaprio Boodle, Shutter Island. Uh, again, if you know, you know. Um, I'm sure you just did this stock up just so you could say. Well, that. I think what's interesting is, is you know, JC Horn, they're monitoring his reps. And so DiCaprio Boodle is getting a lot of first team reps. Mm-hmm. And what's important to note with cornerbacks, if you don't notice them, they're doing probably a pretty good job, right. especially with the way these wide receivers are playing. Right. Troy Hill, I mean, He's in his early 30s. The guy just won't go away. He he's a guy who just smothers the 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 opposing wide receiver. He's leading that nickel corner group. I think he's looked really really good, um, especially given his age and how long he's been playing. There doesn't seem to be a ton of drop off. I think they still need to add to this cornerback group, but they're in a lot better position than I thought they would be. Right. I mean, again first day in pads wide receivers are making plays that's going to happen you know we talk about in baseball the best players you know hit three out of ten balls right like so there's a lot of failure in playing corner that's just the way it is they're paid too you know what i mean particularly when you're going seven on seven drills when the stat the cards are stacked against right and and i think too you know there have been a lot of great plays deontay johnson had a, a slight push off today making an incredible grab off a great throw by um Bryce Young but I also think that speaks to how well Bryce Young's playing he is beating coverage in a way that it's pu- almost purely off his passing ability right like guys aren't like going wide open all the time he's not just hitting wide open players and I think that that's impressive the other guy when you bring up wide receivers is Terrace Marshall you brought up earlier how like we saw a bunch of red herring performances last year yes, in, in Spartanburg. Yes. He was one of those. He got off to a pretty decent start. I was interested to see how he would look in pads because that's kind of what you saw him kind of drop off last year. He's not a special teams player, which is difficult when you have four guys ahead of you on the depth chart in, in Adam Thielen, Deontay Johnson, um, you know, but uh, Xavier Leggett and Adam right, Thielen. Yeah. But he's and making Jonathan Mingo. Yeah, yeah. and Jonathan Mingo. He's making plays that he's never made, mm-hmm. frankly. Um, and I'm anxious. To, we didn't really see him involved too much on Tuesday with the pads, so that's something that bears monitoring. But for the most part, this is a guy who I don't want to say was left for dead on the depth chart, but I didn't have him on my 53 man mm-hmm. roster, mm-hmm. and now he's making me second guess that even with. Amir Smith Marset looking as good as he is doing. I mean, he when we talk about Terrace Marshall, he's this guy who literally was a healthy scratch at the end of right. uh, the season last year. He asked the front office, "Hey, can I be requested to be traded?" And they're like, "Yeah." And they found no takers. Yeah. So I I think what you're saying is totally valid. Let's do one stock down. I'm gonna go with Harrison Nevis, the backup kicker. I say stock down for for a couple reasons. One, uh, it's not that he has been missing a ton of kicks. He went seven for seven on Tuesday in pads. And uh, he did miss a couple in the back together and then Bank of America Stadium on Saturday, but that's another story. Um, the reason why I say this is because I think his stock, at least among the Panthers fan base, was quite high in organized team activities and OTAs. Yeah, he looked great. Um, not only did he look great, the guy who was going to compete for the – the guy who's competing for the job, Eddie Pinheiro, wasn't there, um, or at least in the voluntary sessions. And I think uh, a lot of people were like, okay, we're moving on to this new guy, which people who truly were following the team kind of knew, okay, Eddie's going to come back. This is voluntary, is voluntary for a reason. But um, with Eddie back, just the trio of J.J. Jansen, Johnny Hecker, Eddie Pinheiro, I think that's real solid this year. Maybe, maybe Harrison can find a way on a practice squad, uh, which is something that I think you'll write about later this week. But um, but yeah, for right now, that's my guy's stock. What about you? Just, you know, I call them the specialist three. 
That's what, like, if they were a boy band, you know what I mean? I love it. I could see them doing a cover of Bye Bye Bye. Um, so I'm going to go with a group again. I know it sounds like kind of a cop-out, but this pass rush group outside of Jadavian Clowney is not whimsical, is what I would, that's what I would say, not yeah. whimsical. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there, it leaves a lot to be desired there. Um, but Levon Chason has had some nice moments. He's an athletic uh bendy sort of pass rusher you're gonna do that when you don't have pads on i'm anxious just to see how he looks in pads because for the most part during his career when he's had pads on in live games he has not been particularly productive um dj wadham sideline on pop uh amari barno wearing the number 38 diker ruse also on pop um and for those at home that don't know physically unable to perform list they can come off at any point but wadham's dealing with a quad injury Barno towards ACL last year. I just don't know where this pass rush is coming from. And I've said it before, Ijiro Evero is focused on stopping the run. They've added Josie Jewell. They've added Ashawn Robinson. Jadavian Clowney is one of the elite run-stopping pass rushers in the league at the edge position. That'll help. They finished 23rd in the league in run defense last year. They need to get that up. They've done pretty well in coverage despite the lack of sack numbers. With Frankie Louvu and Brian Burns out of the out of the group, they need somebody to really step up. I don't know who that guy is. Uh, the Iku Leota has gotten a lot of praise from Dave Canales randomly. I think he's a nice player. I do not think he's a guy that can start. I don't think Caleb on Chase on's a guy you want starting. Uh, DJ Wadham is going to take some time to get adjusted. They did work out Yannick Ngakwe. My understanding is that's not like a final situation. Just because they didn't sign him right off the bat doesn't mean that that, you know, he's still available. But he's really more of a situational pass rusher at this time in his career. We talked about wanting to stop the run. He's not a run stopper (laughs) whatsoever. Um, They did sign Kamiko Ture. I would look at him as more of like a camp body at this point. He didn't play last year. He's dealt with injuries. So, like, they're really going to be working the waiver wire for a pass rusher, maybe the trades. They only have about $6 million in cap space. I just don't see where this pass rush is coming from. You know where? Uh, you know who the Panthers could really use right now? Who? I know who you're going with. But <laughs> Go Julius ahead. Peppers. Yes. The man, man who was drafted in 2002, North Carolina, uh, from <laughs> Bailey, North Carolina, went to the University of North Carolina, was a two-sport athlete there. He's going to the Hall of Fame in Canton this weekend uh, or later this week. I wrote a story earlier about this, the man, the folk hero that Julius Peppers was. It's on charlotteobserver.com. A a wonderful website. (laughs) Talked to a whole bunch of uh, his former teammates who were there when he was, when he came into the league in 2002. One of those guys was Mike Rucker. And Mike Rucker will be joining us for an event at Old Mecklenburg Brewery in Ballantyne on Monday, August 5th. Get your tickets. You're going to have Scott Fowler. You're going to have Mike Hay. You're going to have Alex Zetlow. And you're going to have Mike Rucker telling his war stories. Should be a lot of fun. Good beer. Good company. Mike's about to say something. What a tease. My <laughs> man. Um, um, yeah. But, yeah. So, okay. Just real quick. We're, I am about to have – or we're about to um, – you're about to listen to a conversation that Mike Rucker and I had previewing that event after – at the end of this podcast when Mike and I get done. But real quick, Mike. At the beginning of the season, our columnist Scott Fowler wrote a top 30 Panthers of players of all time, celebrating the 30th year of this team's existence. The top four were kind of controversial. You and I, right now, I want us to, to do our top three. Okay. Um, I thought that would be fun. Let's go three, two, one. I'll go three first. You go three, et cetera. Okay. Well, I, I don't mean to keep you in check here. You said the beginning of the season. You meant the beginning of the summer, just so people know. Of course. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Very much. Sorry, Scott. <laughs> the column. Okay. I'm going to start. Number three. I'm going to go Steve Smith. Hey, it's bad radio, but I am as well. I think if you're looking at it from the perspective of what they did as members of the Panthers, I think Steve Smith is probably the second most talented Mm -hmm. panther but i think from like a value standpoint i think he's had an incredible career he belongs in the hall of fame but he would be my number three who's your number two cam newton Mm -hmm. i you know old adage beat writing right the quarterback I, i just like some of the stuff that he has been able to do 
while the records for the run touchdowns has been beaten because of the tush push and whatever. I just think Cam Newton is like, he's like the albino tiger, right? Very hard to find, right? Like it's the, his, his gifts are just unreal. I I think what he's doing in his media career, not that that has anything to do with it. He's going to be incredible at that. Um, What he brought to the Panthers this team was a must follow, whether you were a Panthers right. fan or not. I think he put the brand really on his back. Um, and obviously for Panthers fans, I don't know that it's been fun since he left. They're right. still trying to figure out how to, to fix the quarterback position, even after, you know, I mean, like realistically, you had to draft the guy first overall and trade up and get your guy because you were always chasing the legacy of Cam Newton. And you might know that Cam Newton's quite fast. So chasing that <laughs> legacy is not necessarily gone that well. I mean, some of the numbers that he put up, if you look throughout his career, 194 passing touchdowns, like to go along with what he was able to do as a runner. I he mean, changed the game. I mean, he really did. You know, I grew up a big, um, Randall Cunningham fan. I, I watched Donovan McNabb, uh, Steve Young, guys who had this mobility. They couldn't hold a candle to the dual threat that Cam is. And Steve Young's in the Hall of Fame. I mean, Randall Cunningham was a human joystick, literally. And I think, like, it, anyone my age who got to see those guys in the 90s and then the evolution of the running quarterback from to Cam Newton and, and Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson and all of these guys who have this mobility to win with their arm and their legs, I think it's just, I mean, that's his legacy. Absolutely. My number two is going to be Julius Peppers, and I'm going to go Cam Newton number one. I imagine, if I had to guess, I imagine your number one is also j Yeah, Julius Peppers, to me, is the most talented player to ever put on a Panthers uniform, and I don't think it's close. His teammate said something like, if he had a salesman sell in his body not only would it be cam newton before cam newton he'd be the Deion sanders of the defensive line i mean think about it this way not only was he a standout pass rusher at unc he played basketball and like the old school way like he wasn't like donovan McNabb, where he was on like the bench at syracuse like, <laughs> like julius peppers was like a legitimate two-way he was a contributor on a team that went deep in the ncaa tournament played alongside vince carter played alongside donald Wynn. yeah i feel you yeah. i mean he he was walking them on giants in both both sports like that's incredibly impressive i mean you look at his sack numbers 159.5 sacks 97 with the panthers he had two separate stints with them he played for two legendary franchises with the packers and, and the bears i mean you can write for days about Julius Peppers and Scott and you have uh, really done an impressive job. I just think Julius Peppers, it stuff starts and ends with Julius Peppers with what he brought to this franchise. He was part of two incredibly successful errors of the Panthers, by the way. Yes, absolutely. Um, in the fact check. Yes. I might've screwed up the Donald Williams thing. I definitely did apologize for that, but he did play with amazing players at UNC. I promise you. I know my Carolina basketball. Okay. Uh, reminder, don't forget, buy those tickets for that OMB Valentine event. And on to my interview with Panthers legend, Mike Rucker. What's up, everyone? Alex Zetlow of the Charlotte Observer, alongside Mike Rucker, a Panthers legend in name and in reality. Um, Mike, we saw each other on Saturday at the Back Together event at Bank of America Stadium. It was so fun just witnessing you and your old teammates chop it up and tell stories about the folk hero that Julius Peppers was um, and is still. Um, we might see, we're talking right now. We might see each other in Canton because I'm going up to Canton to cover his induction. Okay. Um, and on Monday, you are going to be you are gracious enough to help us out and talk to Charlotte Observer subscribers who um, will listen to you tell stories just like you did on Saturday. Um, so we've seen a lot of each other. I'm starting to feel like we're brothers. Am I, am I crazy to think that? <laughs> no, much time we have spent together, we can be brothers, you know? <laughs> that's great. I mean, that's, a, that's an honor for me. Uh, I, I do want to start with JPEP, though, we talked about him a lot on Saturday, or I guess I kind of let you and Buck and Will Witherspoon and Dante Wesley kind of lead the conversation, and that was fantastic. But um, what y'all were partners in crime, 
and y'all were the faces of that really formidable defensive line in 2002 and beyond. What do you hope people remember most about him as a player, as a person? I, I, I just, just generally speaking, what does Mike Rucker want people to remember one of his closest friends as? Yeah, you know, I think people, um, they, they know Pep on the outside of, you know, being on the field, uh, being on the basketball court. But I, I don't know how much people know about how much he gives back to the community. Um, he's not necessarily the one, as you can tell, likes the limelight and is beating his own drum and says, hey, I want to be at the front of the line. He's one that he's going to do what's right, and he'll do it in the shadows, and he's okay with that just like he did his playing career, right? Like he would go, he would do his work, he'd get his job done. And then when the cameras came to the interviews, he would always give somebody else the glory. And I think that's the same way off the field that he has carried himself is that he does a lot of stuff for the community, a lot of charity work that doesn't um, necessarily hit the, the front page of the news. And I think that's kind of the way that he likes it. So. I would think that that's one thing I'd, I'd want people to know about him. Like he's got a big heart. Uh, he's a big family man um, with, with his, uh, with his kids and he gives back a lot. Certainly. I think we're going to hear, hopefully we do on, in addition to the stories and the war stories that he shares about his time in the NFL. Hopefully we get to hear a little bit of that in his speech in Canton. Um, are you, do you know what's in his speech? Do you, do you have any idea of what he's going to say? No, but I can tell you that, um, this will be, uh, not only record setting, but this will probably be the most that you've ever heard Julius Peppers talk ever. And I think that that is, uh, widely known. I think people are really excited to hear him because I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. He is a really, really smart guy. Mm -hmm. Um, he loves history not only like, uh, like American or world history, uh, but he knows his basketball history. He knows his football history and um, he likes to read books. And so I think when you're reading a lot that expands your mind and it exposes you to a lot of things that maybe you didn't know when you were growing up. So I'm really excited to hear his speech because you'll hang on to every word because you know that for someone that doesn't speak a lot, um, that when they do speak, people listen. And I think that that's what uh, I'm excited for is to hear him and his speech and what he has to say. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. It was it was funny hearing you and Buck and Will Witherspoon and all those guys talking about. I have no idea what he's going to say because yeah. we rarely heard him talk that much. It, you guys even mentioned he was in the back back of a Nelly music video uh, yeah, hot in here back that. in the day, yeah. and y'all were just like, "Wait, hold on, where are you? We can't find yeah. you." <laughs> yeah, well, that was a big thing because you got to think. You know, Charlotte was a, a, a smaller town that was growing, right? And mm. the team isn't that old, right? I mean, it's less than, you know, 10 years old, um, you know, when Pep gets there. So to see someone being in a music video that is around here in Charlotte, that, that was a big deal. <laughs> and so I just remember um, mess, you know, us messing with them because that's what you do in the locker room. You mess with guys. And um, that, that was a big deal for us. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, one name that interestingly, I didn't even prompt when talking about JPEP with y'all. One name that came up was this guy named Jadavian Clowney. Because one way that a lot of people um, quantify someone's legacy is by how much that person is kind of compared to. In other words, Jadavian Clowney's coming up. Oh, he could be the next Julius Peppers. That means so much to. To yeah. Julius Peppers' name. And that's something yeah. that you astutely pointed out. And now, interestingly, Jadavian Clowney's on this defensive line this year. And so, and obviously he's kind of in the twilight of his career. However, he did just have, he's coming off of a career season in Baltimore last year. So I guess just generally speaking, what do you see from him? What do you think of him? How can he elevate this defensive line? Yeah, you know, I'll kind of take a step back and mm -hmm. Um, I can't remember when we were playing here and when Pep was here, where Clowney was. I imagine that he was probably had some high school because I do remember him coming out of college. And I remember them, you know, making those comparisons, the size, the build, um, being athletic. Um, I remember just visually 
him breaking through a line in college and just blasting. I think it was like the running back, whatever. And so, again, like to your point about Pep, that's when you know that, you know, you're at the top is when people start comparing you. I know for a fact that Pep, um, there's no one out there like him. So he changed that position of the way that you look at it. It wasn't like the big 300-pound defensive end. It wasn't the the, the little 265-pound defensive end. It was this combination that Pep brought to the table that then kind of born this new guy uh, that you look for as a defensive end. And I think Clowney was one of the first guys to come out uh, that had that size, that, that athleticism, and that ability. And obviously him just being right down the road, you know, playing college ball. And so uh, – Just I think like Lewis really, Yes, absolutely. So you, you're – I don't know what the miles or the hours are apart, but very, very similar um, space where they're coming from. And so um, I think it would be really a great conversation to talk to Clowney. Like, what did you see as you were growing up? You know, was this a guy that you modeled your game after? Um, because from the outside, that's what it looked like. And so um, now fast forward into him being in the league and having a great year and, and coming here to be on this defensive line. I think that there are some, whether you go to college ball or where you go to the, to the pros, there are certain position groups that just tend to restock, right? Whether it's a wide receiver or quarterback or defensive end. I believe like the Carolina Panthers, like we are known for our defensive line and we're known for our defensive ends. And I think for him to be able to come in and get his turn at driving the cart at the defensive end spot on the defensive line for the Carolina Panthers, I think it's fitting. I really do. I think it's fitting. Um, you know, coming full circle. You see Pep play college ball here. He comes here, he goes away, and he finishes his career here in Carolina. And, you know, you see, you know, Clowney kind of being from the area and hopefully it's coming full circle to where he ends up, you know, finishing his career on top. And so i um, really excited to see how he helps lead this defensive line. Mike, when you put together all those parallels between the two of them, and considering the fact that they were, or at least Clowney was compared to Pep when he was coming into the league, it's pretty remarkable when you kind of like lay it out like that. That was, yeah, yeah it's fascinating. Um, okay, so before you go, I got to talk about this guy named Bryce Young. Hopefully you've heard of him. Uh, I think a lot of people in Carolina have heard of him. Um, last year, there was the sense that Carolina, at least in training camp during organized team activities, there's a sense that the Carolina Panthers were a quarterback away. We learned that they weren't last year uh, through a variety of reasons. But now Dan Morgan, new general manager, has some new pieces in place. Dave Canales comes in. He's this guy who, who's known to kind of uh, resurrect s s such quarterbacks. Not saying that Bryce Young needs to be resurrected, but he right. has that right. path. Are the Panthers, and this perhaps might be a loaded question, but I'm interested to see where you go with it. Are the Panthers a good Bryce Young season away from being a playoff caliber team now? You know, I think that when you look at, um, you know, a team that's got some pieces and, you know, you're saying, hey, we're just one or two pieces away. Um, there's a there's a sense of on paper, everybody feels good for the most part about their roster. But it's the part that people don't know is how your team gels. Right. It's the kind of unspoken piece. And not only is it hard to be a rookie in this league, but then when, you know, you're a quarterback, it's even harder. And then when you have a lot of uh, moving parts um, on your coaching staff and, and that year, that's a lot to take in. That's a lot to overcome. I think that what I've seen so far is um, a stabilization, right? And I think that that's good. Uh, I think that's good for, for a young quarterback because you have this window to where um, that you can capitalize on. And so sometimes we have a rough season. You don't want that to be your default. You want to reset, right, and recreate that foundation. And I think some of the pieces that they have brought in to help, um, to help him out, I think at the end of the day, the offensive line, um, a, a team will go as the offensive line and the defensive line goes. Uh, you're, you're, it's hard to find a team that doesn't have a good offensive line and defensive line that you're winning. And so when you look at Dan Morgan um, coming in, a former teammate of mine, I, I already know his mindset, you know, and you, you've heard the word like, hey, we want dogs, we want tough, we want smart. 
Um, and that starts up front. That starts up with the guys blocking for him. That starts with the guys stopping the run. And then it starts to build out from there. You know, I think we talked about Saturday. When you, when you live in a house and you build a house, you don't start from the roof and then the, the walls and then the foundation. You start with the foundation first. If you don't got a sturdy foundation, that, that fancy roof that you have will start to be shaky. So as you can see them this offseason really kind of shore up those two groups um, and adding, like we talked about, clowning and, and shoring up that offensive line, that will help Bryce right? You have the receivers, the running backs, you'll, you'll give him time to be able to do what he's doing. And then I think with, with coach coming in and just his mindset, his energy, you know, he's positive, right? It's real easy for everybody to be negative, but to have that positivity around you, I think is going to be a plus this year. So Mike, in other words, when I ask you about Bryce Young, you talk about the entire team without mentioning Bryce Young. And that yeah. is ultimately how Bryce can be successful. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Because I think when you come in as a high draft pick like that, everything, everything is thrown on your shoulders to turn everything around. Mm. Yep. I have not seen one team sport that is won by just one guy. Mm. Right. Now one guy might impact, but even LeBron, it's not LeBron playing against five of their guys. It's a team, right? It's not Bryce playing against all these other defenses. It's a team, Right. And so for in order for him to be successful, he's got a team around him that needs to be successful too, right? And then at the end of the day, you need to be able to learn from your mistakes. And um, so I'm excited about this year. Every year you get to do it over. And I, I remind people that this is what makes this game so fun. You know, in 2001, we were one in 15. In 2003 and four, we went, you know, we went to the Super Bowl. That was two years later, right? So you can improve. Right. And um, you got to get the right players with the right mindset in the right position to be successful. Let's try to give yourself a chance. And um, I like what Dan has done coming in here and uh, kind of resetting the clock, resetting the foundation. And then coach coming here talking about we're going to reset the mindset. Um, the game is 90 percent mental, 10 percent physical. Everybody in there can bench 300 plus pounds, blah, blah, blah. But it's the 90 percent up here. Do I know my plays? Do I know my checks? Those are the things that will dictate whether you win or lose in this league. Spoken like a true defensive lineman who kind of called their own plays in that 2002, 2003, 2004 uh, magical era in Carolina Panthers lore. Mike, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Before we go, uh, the proceeds from Monday's live event with you at Old Mecklenburg Brewery on Monday night, uh, it'll go toward the best defense foundation yeah. Um, I'd really love for you, and this is a charity that means a lot to you. I'd really love for you to share a little bit about its mission and, um, you know, what it does and what it means to you. Yeah. You know, so over the last probably three, four years, I've really um, gotten close um, to a friend of mine named Donnie Edwards. He played about 14 years in the league for the Kansas City Chiefs and the, and the Chargers. Um, a lot of family in the military. Um, and so basically he started a foundation basically to support our military. And, you know, if you've seen any of the, the Normandy things in the last couple of months, you know, he took over 50 uh, World War II vets back to Normandy. Average age, 100 years old, right? Some of them are getting closure. Some of them are um, just being able to be loved upon. Um, and so when you look at some of the things that he does for our military, um, I just love that. And so, you know, one of the things that um, uh, we do is we'll try to find a way to bridge uh, the NFL legends right, guys that have played this game and our military vets will get a small group together in Utah and we'll bring them together. And we talk about transition. That's just one of his programs. And that's one that I've really fallen in love with is because you get two groups of, of people that have been the best of the best of what they have done and the sacrifices that they made. Now, I've always said their end goal has been different than ours because we play a sport. But the things that we go through are very similar. Teamwork, mm -hmm. being in close-knit quarters, um, wanting to win, to be the best of the best. And so Donnie has just done a fantastic job of, you know, taking guys back to places where they're getting closure, loving up on our military vets. And uh, so the Best Defense Foundation is close to my heart, and that's that's the one that I want to support, um, you know, when we when we get together. And um, if you get a chance, I mean, he's on uh, the IGs, he's on the social media side. You can just Google that and just take a peek at it. And uh, just see what what he's up, what he's doing, what he's up to, and how he's impacting our vets. 
um, as they come home and being able to love upon them. Mike, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we'll see each other for a third time in five days. That's right. <laughs> then, oh, maybe not five days. My math is a little wrong, but on Monday, we'll see each other again. It'll be Great. pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> Great to see you, man. All right, buddy. Have a good one.